place guards in front of the tomb to let nobody go in. He was just waiting for the three days. He's probably drinking soda while eating hot Cheetos. <laughs> he would probably play games like Candyland and then have a party by himself. <laughs> the okay. Easter Bunny was hiding behind a tree. <laughs> He probably went out there and there's just so eggs everywhere. And then he's gonna say, there's one money egg, so you better find it. You can get some money. <laughs> Three days later, there was a big earthquake. <laughs> I think we should go away somewhere safe. It's like, I'm getting out of here. The earth is shaking, run for your lives. <laughs> and the guards ran off because they got scared. And then on Sunday, Mary and some of her friends came with some spices. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. His clothes only was there. Then an angel came and said, don't be afraid. Jesus has risen from the dead. Go tell the, go tell everyone, go tell the good news. Mary and her friends went and told the disciples. She said, Jesus has risen from the dead. Guys, guys, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples didn't believe them. No, that couldn't happen. Jesus can't raise from the dead. Uh, I don't believe it until I see it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus just came Jeff was there. I am Jesus. I am the I'm the I am the Son of the Lord God. And I am Jesus, your friend. And then the disciples said, Jesus, it's you! Yay! Jesus is alive! Totes cool. Jesus, before he left to heaven, he said, I have done what I have came to done. And then he was going up to heaven. His disciples were crowded around him. The disciples said, holy guacamole. I can't believe Jesus really flew. That's awesome. Now what? Let's go tell the news. You know, I had something real serious to, to start with, and I'm not even going to try it now. <laughs> the perspective of children, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is. Good morning. Good morning. Well, you're alive. I like that. It's good to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Easter Sunday at City Reach. We're glad you're here. Our verse of the week from Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's our verse this week. Prayer focus of the week is, thank you, Lord, that the same Holy Spirit who anointed and filled Jesus with resurrection power now fills and anoints me in the same manner. Lord, I pray today that you will refresh my anointing and fill with the power of your Holy Spirit. Help me to speak graciously but with authority the words that will set any captive free. That's the answer to now what do we do? <laughs> they were right. Go tell. Go tell. Well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we've got a lot of announcements. Let me move through those quickly. We have a couple of cards on the back table back there. One for Brother Gabe, who's still in the hospital. Keep him in your prayers. And then one for uh, Ben, who's been providing baked goods. And you, if you go back in the little room back over there uh, in this building, uh, you'll find many of them covered in icing. You'll like that. So it's perfect for Easter Sunday. Kingdom Men will meet tomorrow night. We'll meet at 6 o'clock. Hope you'll be here. Foundations class is dismissed this week. There'll be no Foundations class this week, but it'll be back next week. Warrior Wednesday, this Wednesday night, 6.30. Be here, Royal Rangers at the same time. They run concurrently, the Royal Rangers for boys 
ages 5 to 18 in the multipurpose building. That's from uh, 6.30 Wednesday night until 8 o'clock. And then back in the back, Tracy's back there with his display of all the Royal Ranger paraphernalia. So go back there, check that out. You'll find it very interesting. If you, like I, and I know you ladies weren't, were in Boy Scouts, you'll find a great similarity, um, and uh, you'll, enjoy, you'll enjoy it. Kingdom Women on Thursday evening, 6.30 with uh, Carmen, and then Fresh for the Teens on... Uh, on Friday night, I'm thinking this means free-range estrogen and uh, stray hormones. I'm not positive. But anyway, uh, that's Friday night, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Uh, teenagers, uh, well, youngsters, 12 to 17 in the multipurpose building. And then Kingdom Kids is still in need of nursery and uh, chapel leaders and helpers. So if you can help with that, please, please uh, see Sister Rain about that. Uh, we will have a baptism today. It's not that pastor's going to take a bath finally. It's, <laughs> it's, it's that we are having a baptism today. All right. I hope you'll, uh, hope you'll stick around for that. And then, of course, tithes and offerings in the, in the white containers on the sides over here. And, of course, you can give online as well. And that's in your bulletin. But I'm not going to keep you from what the main event is, and that's the Word of God. And that's uh, brought by our pastor, Pastor George. Oh, go ahead and clap. Come on. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Love you, Dan. Thank you. Guys, let me just let me just start off by just reading you a scripture, because here's the thing. If the word of God's not going to get you fired up today, I'm not. Amen. Can I just speak truth? Yes, sir. If the word cannot get you up out of your seats and celebrating an almighty, amazing God. And let me tell you, there's some of you in here may say, well, pastor, it's hard for me to get out of out of my seat. Well, start practicing it more. Yeah, you heard me say it right. You heard me say it. Let me just tell you right now. Are we a church that truly believes that our God is an awesome God? Amen. And if he is an awesome God, do you know why you believe that? Because here's the thing. I hear a lot of people saying, hey, my God's an awesome God. I say, great, tell me why. And they're like, well, he's awesome. Why is he awesome? Right? Is that fair for me to ask that question? Because the Word's going to ask me that question. They're going to say, why is your God awesome? And I'm going to say, my God is awesome because He gave His only begotten Son, brought Him into this world. He came in human flesh. He lived life. He went through trial, tribulation, and temptation. Then He went to a cross that I should have been hung on. He died a criminal's death. I should have died, but He didn't stay there. He went to hell itself to let the devil know the debt had been paid and he no longer has power over us then he resurrected from the dead just because Amen. I mean if you're doing all those things why not just raise from the dead on top of that right yeah. and then we say here we go church I'm just saying then we say hey God we're going to give you a special day where we're going to actually jump up and shout then the special day comes and we're like humada 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 because let me just say this to you right now. As a believer, Resurrection Day is not today. Resurrection is every day. Amen. Every day. I'm going to just say this, and, and I'm going to tell you, the Lord has just put this upon my heart because we don't need to give in to the lies of the enemy anymore, which tell people, hey, if you show up on Easter Sunday for the next 25 years, you're going to be fine. No, you're not. If you came in a sinner on Easter Sunday and you didn't give your life to Christ, you're leaving here a sinner. If you came in here knowing that you were a sinner and didn't do anything about it, I'm sorry to tell you these news. You're condemned still. But if you realize what Jesus has done for you and you receive that, then it doesn't matter whether it's on this Sunday or next Sunday or the Sunday after the Sunday after. Jesus Christ is alive and well, and he still forgives, and he still saves, and he still redeems. So I'm going to just tell you right now, what you see happening today isn't special. We believe that it happens every day. I'm just saying right now, if you came to service today and you came like, where's this and where's that? And I'm expecting this, expecting that. Let me tell you, what we should all be expecting on Sunday is God's presence and the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. Amen? Do you feel the Spirit moving in this place today? I hope so because you're going to be out of your seats in just a minute because i got a powerful scripture to read to you out of Matthew 28. And it says here, early on Sunday morning. Now, let me just say this. This was not written in New Mexico. Okay, because we don't know what early is. 
okay? We know what siestas are. Yeah. Come on. Well, this is, I've heard, this is the land of manana, right? Not the church. We are not the church of manana. We are the church of now. Amen? Amen. Amen. One more time. Amen. Come on. Right? It says early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning. Can I just tell you, every day is a new day? Amen. Every day you get to start a new day. So it doesn't matter how bad you lived out the day before. God says it is a new day today. I woke up today and God says it's a new day, George. A new day filled with my love and filled with my mercies. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to just let you know my son is alive and well. I don't serve a Jesus in a tomb. And let me just say this right now. If you need to go to Israel and pay $5,000 to get on a plane to find out if the tomb is empty or not, you go ahead and do that. Or you come here to this church for free, get a cupcake and some coffee, and find out that your Jesus is alive and well because the tomb is empty. Amen. Come on. And it says here that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Now let me just tell you something about this. Mary Magdalene, if you don't know her story... Filled with demons, prostitute, Lord knows what else she was in, probably addicted to drugs and everything else. And Jesus comes into her, into her life, and he transforms her, he redeems her, he saves her. And I just want you to know right now, isn't it funny that when we read this story, it's not the 12 men that he had called to follow him that show up at the tomb. It's a woman that had been redeemed and released and set free from sin. Come on, church. What are you waiting for? Right? I mean, we are so hesitant. And, and I'm just telling you right now, I'm alive and well, and I'm going to act like I'm alive and well today. Because I know what Jesus did for me. I'm going to tell you right now, I woke up this morning. You know what I celebrated? I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to hell, people. How about you? Do you know you're not going to hell this morning? Do you know it? Do you know it? Do you know it? Oh, by the way, that's the title of today's sermon. Do you know it? Look at this. It says right here, suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and then he sat on it. He rolled away the stone. You know why? Not, mm, Holy Spirit, light us up. He didn't roll away the stone because it was in the way. He rolled the stone away to make the way for the King of kings and the Lord of lords to come out exalted because he had defeated death and the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've got a brother right now that's in the hospital. Thursday night he was fighting for his life. Last night I heard he had a rough night. But you know what I was reminded of? Saturday, before the resurrection, Jesus had a rough night. Amen. He was letting the enemy know, you're done. It's over, right? But there was a fight going on. There was a fight going on. The enemy going, wait a minute, you couldn't have paid it all? Yep, I did pay it all. I fulfilled what God said. And then the enemy tried to raise up all his demons and minions to come against Jesus. And you know who showed up? The Holy Spirit. Spirit, the Spirit of God. It says here, the same Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead is in you and me today, if you believe it. And the Holy Spirit showed up and said, is there a problem? Do we have a problem in this place? And the devil shut his mouth and his minions began to tremble and shake as they remembered that this was the Son of God. And Jesus took the keys of death and the grave from him. And he marched out of that grave. And when the women showed up, an angel is sitting on the stone. And the ladies are going, where is Jesus? And I love what they said. He is not here. Say it, church. For he is what? He is what? Why are you still sitting? Why are you still sitting? Why are you sitting, church? Come on. Stand up. Is he risen? Yes, he is. Come on. Come on. Why are you sitting? Why are you sitting? 
Jesus didn't come out on a wheelchair from that grave. Jesus didn't come out on crutches. Jesus didn't come out crawling. He came out standing. I am alive and well. Yeah, you may be watching this to say and say, hey, Pastor, aren't you getting kind of crazy over here? Can I just tell you something? I was dying and going to hell. But I'm not anymore. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power of God unto salvation to all who would believe it. Do you believe it this morning, church? Do you believe it this morning, church? Do you believe it this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Rick, were we able to get that one song? Let's just check on this. If we get it, great. If not, we can just shout for another minute or two. But I'm just telling you right now, I didn't come here to play church this morning. I didn't come here to tickle your ears. I didn't come here to preach a philosophy. I'm here to give you the word of God and the truth. I'm just telling you right now, if we are going to see a change in our community, then there's got to be a change in our churches. And we've got to stop preparing for Easter's and start just simply preparing for daily life. We need to prepare the body for daily living, not for Easter's and Christmas's. Yeah, you heard me right, and I may be ruffling some pastor's feathers. I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong. All I'm just saying is please make sure that Jesus is the center of it all. That's all I'm saying, because here's my thing. If my church can't be excited next Sunday, then what are we doing? If you can't be excited when you wake up tomorrow, then what are we doing? Why are we here? Why are we wasting his time? I'm going to tell you right now. God doesn't see you as a waste. He sees you as a whole. Amen? Amen. That's what he does. He sees you as a whole in Jesus' name. And I'm going to tell you right now, God is not finished with you yet because if he was, you wouldn't be here this morning. Amen. Anybody excited about being here this morning? Amen. Come on. Come on. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, you come into this church, I'm going to wear you out. You're going to break a sweat. You might even lose a few pounds. I'm just telling you right now, I am not going to be a pastor that sits up here and just goes, mm-hmm. no. I got people that are going to hell in our community and they need Jesus Christ. And the world is speaking loud. Well, I'm going to speak louder. How about you, church? You want to get loud? Then let's get loud. Let's get shouting. Let's get praising. Come on, raise that up, brother. Pump it up. Pump it up. Come on, church, raise your hand.
if God says that where it was once dry, now there's going to be rivers flowing. Guys, come on. That should be real for us who live in this desert. Hallelujah. That should be a big deal. But it, let me just say this. It's God's plan. It's God's plan. And I never want us to go, anytime we do anything, whether it's a Monday night men's meeting, a women's fellowship, a Wednesday night, a Sunday morning, I never want us to be in a place where someone who is lost comes in here and stays lost because we look lost. You feel me? God's gotten a hold of my heart. He says, I know you're not ashamed, George. But I need you to raise it up another level. I need you to understand that my son was resurrected from the dead. That should be a big deal to you. He could have hung on that cross, but he didn't. He didn't stay there. He didn't stay there. And he could have stayed in that tomb, but he didn't stay there. You'll never have to hang on a cross, church. You'll never have to go to hell to deal with the devil. Oh, you may say, well, pastor, sometimes my days are hell. Well, that ain't the devil's fault. Can I be real? It ain't the devil's fault. Because God says that the gates of hell can't come against his people. They can't overcome his people. Right? Yeah, you're going to face trial, trouble, tribulation. Listen to Jesus' story. He failed to face trial, trouble, tribulation. And he made it. So can you. In fact, you have. Can I speak that word over all of you? Everybody in this room, you have. God has. But I'm just telling you right now, if a church is going to come to know God, then let them come to a church that allows God to be God. That's why the word comes first. We're going to get to worship. There may be somebody new here today. We welcome you if you're here. And you may be saying, why aren't we worshiping yet? Because we haven't gotten the word yet. See, the word gets you to worship. We need to hear from the Lord this morning. He said, Pastor, I'm already hearing from the Lord. He's just getting started. He's just getting started. I got some news for you. I got some instruction for you. I got a word for you. Because here's what God is saying about this time. He is saying, I need a church. I need a church that believes in me. Not in themselves, not in the tithes and offerings, not in their buildings, not in their abilities. I need a church that is willing to believe in me. See, you're not always going to have access to me. Okay, I don't answer my phone 24-7. It's impossible for me to do that. I can't meet with everybody every day. I wish I could, but I can't. But I'm going to tell you right now, there is a God who is faithful, who's omnipotent, yeah. omniscient, omnipresent. Yeah. And that's the God I'm introducing to you because if God were to take me tomorrow, you should still be able to be the church. Amen. Because of who our God is. Amen. Amen. So the message titled this morning is, Do You Really Know? Do You Really Know? If you have your Bibles, Mark 16, Mark 16, I put this chair up here. I'm going to try to behave myself this morning, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm excited because God's word is alive and well, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to walk in my calling before you and to share with you the word of God. Here's the thing, though, what you decide to do with it, church, is up to you, not up to me. It's up to you. I'm sharing with you what I decided when God came and gave it to me. I decided I was going to receive it. And it comes with instruction. It comes with correction. It comes with direction. And it comes with grace and love and mercy. Amen. This is God at his fullest. But he wants his church to be a church that really knows. Here's the thing. You cannot say you believe in something if you really don't know that something. You can't believe in someone unless you really know that someone. I'm just telling you right now. Look, I used to hear it back in my day, back in the uh, the 80s and the 90s. It was all about Michael Jordan. It was all about his abilities. It was all about his shoes and what he wore and everything like that. Can I just tell you this right now? But you can never say you truly believed in Michael Jordan until you met the man. Other than that, 
He was just what you wanted him to be. Here's the thing. God doesn't want to be what you want him to be. He wants you to be what he wants you to be. Amen. You're going, wait a minute, Pastor, can you say that again? No. Read your Bible. You'll hear the same thing I just heard. Amen? Amen. Listen to this. Message Bible. After raising from the dead. <laughs> to me, that's a big deal. Amen. You know why? Because I've been there. And later on, I'm going to share a testimony about my wonderful wife, Laura. She was there. I almost lost her three different times in 48 hours, and I'll share that testimony with you. And she's back there. She's going to make sure I get all the facts straight. And it was a while back. But I, 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 I just want you to know, I know what it means to be raised from the dead and see people raised from the dead. And it says there, Jesus appeared early on Sunday morning to Mary Magdalene, whom he had delivered from seven demons. How many? Seven. Now, here's the thing you need to understand. Where there's one demon, there's an army of demons. So, Brother Mark, if there is a legion of demons per demon, how many demons did this poor girl have tormenting her? Hundreds. 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 I want you to understand that Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb first is a big deal because it was a big deal to Mary Magdalene because she knew what Jesus had done for her. Here's a question, church. Do you really know what Jesus has done for you? And you may say today, Pastor, I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. What well, you're going to hear about him today, and I'm going to tell you right now, he's going to give you an opportunity to receive him today, and you can leave here. Today can be your day of salvation. Amen, church? Because that's what we're going to preach from this pulpit. We're going to preach the salvation of the Lord. And so she went to his former companions, now weeping and carrying on. Now, what we're talking about here are his disciples. These are the guys that followed him. And the guys who had followed and seen Jesus, the Peter who had said, Jesus, I'm going to stand with you, and I'm, no one's going to hurt you, and you're not going to no cross. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? They're weeping and they're moaning and they're carrying on. See, here's the thing. You can weep in pain, and that's okay. God gets it. But sometimes, church, we weep like fools. We blubber like idiots. Oh, pastor, you can't say that in church. I just did. Because I've been there. There's a difference between a genuine cry before God and me just acting out like a fool. And these disciples were acting out like a fool. And they saw a young man, and he was sitting on the right side, dressed all in white. Can I just say this to you right now? Do you understand what it means to be dressed all in white? Let me tell you, I don't get dressed up all in white unless it's a big deal. When I get dressed up in white, it is. I'm excited. I'm thrilled. People are like, Pastor, you would wear all white? I did one time because it was my birthday, and my wife took me to a Mexican restaurant, which I found out I should not go in an all-white suit to a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> Shouldn't do it. But I was so excited because I was celebrating my 18th birthday. Yeah, I'm 18 now. I know everything. I can tell my parents to just leave me alone. I can get my own place. I can party every night. I can do what I want. I can tell people to just read my palm of the hand and leave me alone. In other words, what we used to say back in the day, shut your face. And let me just tell you, yeah, I talk to the hand, right? Guys, I was an idiot. Because I believe that the world said when I turned 18, I was a man. Can I just tell you something right now? Your age does not determine your maturity. Amen. The spirit within you determines your maturity. Which spirit is in you? Is it these demons or is it the one who raised Jesus from the dead? Come on. I love it. Anyone else want to join our friend there? Say it. Come on, Jesus. Oh, come on, church. I, I'm just saying to you, the world gets more excited about their beer. I've been to those parties. Everybody, Miller Light! And everyone's shouting. We come in and say, Jesus! Hey, Jesus. Hey. Golf clap. Golf clap. I'm telling you. You're going to get rough in this place because I don't want to come to a church that is dead. I'm not walking into a tomb. I'm walking into the sanctuary, the house of God. 
and God tells me that things in his house are alive and well, my question is, do you believe it, church? If you do, say Jesus. Jesus. There we go. Come on. Come on. All it needs is a little practice. That's it. We just need some practice. And they were completely taken aback and astonished when they heard her report that she had seen him alive and well. They didn't. Say it with me, church. They didn't believe her. They didn't believe her. What are you talking about, Jesus alive and well? We watched him die on the cross. Later he appeared, but in a different form, to two of them out walking in the countryside. And they went back and told uh, the two of them, uh, they went back and told the rest, but they wouldn't believe either. Still later, as the eleven were eating supper, hey, I love this. As much as the disciples were mourning and weeping and feeling shame, they still fed their faces. I'm just, guys, can I be real? This is being written this way so, so we can get it. The way they lived back then is the way we're living right now. Because it doesn't change unless we get Jesus in our lives, unless we receive the Holy Spirit, unless we believe that God is who he says he is, church. This is what his word says, and I don't want to be this. See, I used to be one of these people when I got upset, I ate. Oh, I could be upset, but, you know, my wife would be all like, babe, I thought you, you were upset. I am, I, I'm, but I'm having a steak and potato. And not one steak, I'm having two steaks. Guys, I'm just telling tell you right now, what, we're tr- what God is trying to speak to us is the church has become dependent on potlucks, not on his presence. We would rather get the service over with and, get, and, and see what goodies are on the table then give God time in his presence and worship him and please him. And we're looking at the clocks. We're looking at the clocks and we're just going, well, you know, we got things to do and we got this to do. Well, why didn't you do that before? Why are you waiting until now? I'm just saying, don't blame God when you don't have your schedule right. That's not his problem. And I just want to speak to you right now, church, because I'm reading this passage. Here's what I discovered. Here's where we're making our mistake as a church and how we're talking to people. We are promising people things that God never promised. We take the word prosper and we tell people, if you will give your tithes and offering to the Lord, then God will reward you and you'll have money in your bank account. You'll have this, you'll have that. We'll ha- we have TV evangelists that are on the TV and they're dipping claws and vegetable oil and saying, if you, we've prayed over this, but if you'll send a thousand dollars to my ministry, this cloth will be a blessing to you and cover you and help you to prosper. We've bought the lies We've gotten fat on the world's junk, Amen. not on the real truth Amen. that Jesus is alive and well, that he is the resurrection and the life, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Church, I'm just telling you right now, we got to get right with God because we've been giving baloney to the world. They don't need baloney. They need Jesus. Amen. But if you don't believe that, they're not going to believe it, and the world knows because they can see someone who's full of garbage. They see it. Guys, I'm just telling you right now, we need to get right and understand this. I get it. We want miracle signs and wonders. We do. We want miracle signs and wonders. But here's the thing. God doesn't want you depending on a miracle. God wants you depending on him. I'm just saying that as I'm reading this, God is speaking to my heart. He's saying, these men were depending not on, my, on me. And here's the thing. Jesus constantly was trying to tell them God has a plan. He was telling them that God has a plan. And they missed it. They wouldn't pay attention. They made their own plans. Proverbs says it. Many plans does a man make, but it is the Lord who directs their steps. We make a lot of plans. Guys, can I tell you, stop making plans and start listening and paying attention to God's plan. See, if the disciples would have paid attention to God's plan, then they would have known what Jesus was going to have to go through, but they would have also known that he didn't have to come off a cross and go, da-da! 
They would have known the plan that would have been he's going to die, shed his blood so that all can confess their sins and be set free. And oh, by the way, I'm not going to leave him dead. I'm going to resurrect him. That was in the plan. But they weren't paying attention to the plan. They wanted a miracle. You want a miracle in your life? Start following God's plan because miracles are a part of God's plan. But we get it backwards. We want the miracle so that we'll follow God's plan. We need obedience. We need to follow God. Guys, I'm just telling you right now, we are these disciples. That's where the church has ended up. We are this, and we're trying to offer the world everything to make them think that everything is glorious. Can I tell you, there's nothing glorious in this world. I don't want to stay here. I've got a home up in glory waiting for me. But here's the thing. God says, but before I take you home, would you tell somebody that they have hope, that they can have a home too? Guys, we have gone and we said, God, give me the miracle. And God is like, how about if I just gave you the plan? Sometimes in the midst of our suffering, we're crying out, God, give me a miracle. And God is going, your suffering is the plan. See, the disciples would need to suffer so they would understand that even with everything Jesus had done, it didn't take the suffering away but it gave peace in the midst of suffering. Hallelujah. And guys, let me just tell you this right now. I was thinking about all the fires that are burning, right? Now, let me just tell you, God is so awesome because we've seen nothing but smoke all week long in our community with the big, what is it, the big hole fire? Is that what they were calling it? Yeah, big hole fire, right? Let me just tell you something. The first day I found out about the fire, I told my wife this. I said, do you know what's awesome about this fire? She goes, what's awesome about the fire? There's no fire that burns that God's not in the midst. I began to share that with my pastor friends. I'm like, I want to encourage you and tell you right now, these fires that are burning, I'm not fearing them because God's in the midst. You know how I know? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a fire, and God was in the midst of that. It reminds me that when a fire burns, God shows up. See, men were struggling to control the fire. God wasn't. He wasn't struggling to control it. You say, well, what about the people who lost their homes? Or Can I just say this to you right now? Sometimes we don't realize that we gain more in loss. Yeah. Because what we had was keeping us from gaining what God wanted you to have, which is more precious and more permanent than what the world can give you. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense to the world. You know what? My Bible says it don't make any sense. But you know how you help them make sense of it? You tell them about your Jesus. You testify to his glory. You testify to the fact that he is alive and well, right? Verse 15, he said, then he said, go into the world, go everywhere and announce the message of God's good news to one and all. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Whoever believes and is baptized. Guys, can I say this to you right now? This church is going to be a church that's going to evangelize the gospel and baptize people. So get your tubs ready. They don't have to come here on Sunday. If they get saved and they want to be baptized, then you figure out where there's a water source and you do it. If you need to come here to do it, fine. We'll fill the tub up. But I'm just telling you right now, we get people to believe and we stop there. No, 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 no. There has to be a symbolism that was set forth because Jesus raised up into a new life. So will you. So we're going to have baptisms today, but I'm going to tell you this right now. What we've got to stop doing is leading people to Christ and then going, now we're going to take you through a six-week course on baptism. Because I read my Bible. There was a eunuch that needed to know Christ, and Philip was sent by God to go into the middle of nowhere, an Ethiopian, right, in the middle of nowhere. He goes to him. He get, leads him to Christ, and the man says, can I get baptized? And he didn't say, well, no, I'm sorry. You're going to have to go to Caesarea where we have a six-week class on baptisms. Can I just tell you this right now? If you're already speaking salvation and they receive it, then tell them the good news about baptism. Because that's good news too. I'm just telling you right now, there's not enough people getting wet because they go through three weeks of the class, start feeling guilt and shame, and decide that they can't be baptized. When I got saved, Jesus released me of my guilt and shame. I wanted nothing more after that than to get wet. I'm just telling you right now, church, we're going to be a church that leads people to Christ and then baptizes them. Oh, and by the way, here's the third thing we're going to do. 
and then we're going to release them to serve the Lord. Amen. What? What? What do you mean we're going to release them? What do they know? Can I just say this right now? What do you know? Amen. Who do you know? I'm just saying that we have new believers coming in, and guess what? We're going to speak the truth to them. We're going to have discipleship for them. But you know what Jesus was showing us with the disciples? Part of discipleship is serving. Amen. And it looks different. Okay, doesn't mean we're going to have them teach in a class or anything like that, but they can pass out bulletins. They can welcome people. They can help pastor get the baptismal ready. They can come and clean. They can do all these other things. And you would say, well, pastor, that sounds more like a janitorial service. Then tell me something. Are you calling Jesus a janitor because he washed feet? Amen. You hear me, church? Jesus washed feet, so you're going to call him a janitor? No, he was a life changer. Amen. And we need to be that. We need to have that. We have to believe that we, through Christ, are life changers as well. Amen? And so, guys, look at this. It says here right now, it says here, there are some of the signs that uh, he says, whoever believes and baptizes is saved, whoever refuses to believe is going to receive damnation. He's just being honest and transparent. He said, there are, these are some of the signs that will accompany believers. They will throw out demons in my name. They will speak in new tongues. They will take snakes in their hand. They will drink poison and not be hurt. They will lay hands on the sick and make them well. I just want to clarify something real quick just so people know this. This wasn't permission to go grab poisonous snakes and let them bite you. Amen. This isn't permission for you to go and drink detergent. To prove to somebody. No, what he was saying is the world hates us for loving Jesus, so they're going to try to poison you. The world hates you so much that, and let me just tell you, when I say the world, I'm talking about the enemy and his minions, right? They're going to try to put snakes under your pillow. See, this is what he's talking about. See, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will get snakes under your pillow, and someone's going to try to put poison in your glass. Because the enemy, he doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to kill you. He wants you dead. See, you're better off if you're not alive. Okay? If you're still breathing, you're still a problem to the kingdom. At least I pray if you're still breathing, you're a problem to the kingdom. See, or not the kingdom, but the kingdom of the enemy. Let me make that clear. Okay? I'm talking about the kingdom of the enemy, church. Okay? But just get this right now. Expect snakes, expect poison, but it won't harm you. Because God's going to use you in a mighty way. Then it says, then the master Jesus, after briefing them, okay, there was a briefing. You know why you get briefings? So you can be told what you need to do. See, we go to briefings, and you know what we do in our briefings? Cell phone time. Angry bird time. I don't even know all the other video games. That, there's so many out there, right? And you say, Pastor, how do you know that? I've sat in church before. I got a cell phone. I know when the pastor was boring me, I was like, well, let me just go on here and, you know. I get it. Put away your cell phones. You don't need them right now. Put them away. You don't need them right now. I'm just telling you right now, just listen to what God has to say. See, when we were in the military, they didn't have us do anything else. They said, you bring paper, you bring a pencil, which, oh, by the way, they gave to us, right? They said, here's your notebook, here's your pencil. Now, when the commander speaks, you take notes. We were responsible for taking notes for the word of God, right? Church, you're responsible to take notes from what God's trying to tell you. If you leave here today without instruction, that's your fault. That's not mine. We need to get back to where when we go to a briefing, we listen to the speaker. And I'm not talking me. It's not me speaking to you today. It's the God, God himself who's speaking through me to you today. Amen. Just saying. Okay, but if we will do that, then we'll hear this. Listen to this. Then he briefed him. He was taken up to heaven and he sat down before God in the place of honor. Right. This is what God promised him. And the disciples went away, everyone preaching the master working right with them, validating them, uh, validating their message, showing them, being able to show them with indisputable evidence. Here's my question. Where are you going to go and preach today? And I'm saying today, because you might not get tomorrow. There's no promise you're going to get to preach the gospel tomorrow. My question is, who are you going to preach to today? Because after we leave church here today, you're still going to have sunlight. You're still going to have the ability to share with somebody. I'm just saying, some of you are going to leave here today and go have lunch. What are you going to talk about? 
what are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about the, 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 the draft, the football scores, politics, and the problems in the world. What are you going to talk about? Or are you going to be willing to change the atmosphere wherever you go by talking about Jesus? Because I'm going to tell you this right now. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about him. And I don't know who's going to be listening when I'm talking, but I just want to make sure that if I'm talking Jesus, that they hear Jesus. And maybe without me even knowing it, they're going to give their life to Jesus. Amen. See, guys, we don't get excited about Jesus because, let's be honest, he's not the every moment love in our life. We think that there are days that we can live without him. Can I tell you, you would have no life without him. Right? I know it's heavy. I know this is what you weren't expecting, that you were just like, we're going to shout, we're going to be like Jesus alive in tomb, and pastor's going to walk out, and there's no, ah! Let me just tell you something right now. They're shouting like fools, and they're shouting in faith. Hallelujah. Church, God wants to teach us how to shout in faith. Amen. The world shouts like fools, Hallelujah. but we are not of this world. Amen. Or are we? We have to think about that. We got to be honest. That's a question we got to ask, right? Very quickly, very, very quickly. I want you guys to to go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 52. There were several scriptures I had. I'll give you the references before I close. But I want us to go to this passage because this passage of scriptures would really open my eyes to what God wanted to speak to today. Isaiah chapter 52. Start at verse 7. Isaiah 52 verse 7 says here, how beautiful are on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Does anyone believe in here that our God reigns today? Do you, church? Do you believe that this morning? Yes. Come on, your God reigns, right? Yes. He says, listen, your watchmen lift up their voices together. They shout for joy. Hey, the watchmen are shouting for joy. Are any watchmen in here today shouting for joy? Come on, come on. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. They will burst into songs of joy together. Your, your, your ruins of Jerusalem for the people. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Anyone excited about that? Anyone excited about that? Come on. This is what God has done, right? This is it. And the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Does anybody want to see the salvation of our God this morning? Here's a better question. Has anyone in this room seen the salvation of our God this morning? Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Right. So quickly, verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely and he will succeed. Listen to this. See, my servant will act wisely and he will succeed. Do you know who, who we're talking about here? We're talking about Jesus. Amen, Sister Kara. We're talking about Jesus. He's going to succeed. He'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will begin to understand it really hit me as I was going through, and guys, let me tell you, we'll finish out the series we're on. We're going to finish that out next week. But it was this passage of scripture that a friend sent to me on Tuesday. He didn't say anything. He just sent me the scripture. But as I read the scripture, it began to speak to me because I began to realize, guys, that Jesus, you know how it says in Hebrews, who for the joy went to the cross? Amen. I've always wondered how he had joy going to the cross because, you know what, Brother Allen, I wouldn't have had joy. Even if I'd known that the whole world would have been saved, you know why? Because sometimes I hate the world. You know, I hate, and let me just say this, it's, it's true. Sometimes pastors just like, Ugh, yeah, Lord, and God's going, well, I'm going to love them and save them, so you just better learn to love them, right? I don't want to, God. 
Guys, can I just say this to you right now? Jesus had joy going to the cross because there was a promise made in Isaiah that he would succeed. God told his son before he came to earth, he said, I'm just going to tell you something. Jesus, you're going to succeed. It's going to be hard, and you're going to get discouraged, and you're going to go up into the mountain for many hours and many days to pray to me because you're going to say, Lord, if you can take this cup from me, I'm just going to tell you I won't because you're going to succeed. And that began to speak to me because I'm going, wait a minute. So our problem then is when we think about the resurrection is we focus on the miracle, not the plan. Guys, can I tell you, miracles will be for a moment, but plans are forever. You can have your miracle moment, but let me tell you, the miracle is because of a plan, not the other way around. God had a plan for Jesus to succeed. Can I say this to you? God has a plan for you to succeed. He has a plan for you to succeed. So what I'm telling you is get off the miracle wagon and get on God's plan. Get on God's plan for your life. You may look at it and say, Pastor, I need a miracle. Maybe not. Maybe what you need is to ask God to show you his plan and realize that his plan is going to lead to many miracles. I want to be in God's will. And that means that sometimes I want to be in places where I'm like, are you sure this is your will, God? And here's what God's going to tell me. If you're in my word, you're going to know my will. If you're communing with me every day, you're going to know my will. Can I say it? Jesus knew God's will for his life, and he knew he would succeed. And this gave me great hope to come to you and say today, church, I'm here to tell you, I don't care what your circumstances, I don't care what your problems are, I don't care whatever trial or temptation you're going through, even, even if you're battling right now with a sin in your life and going, I can't seem to have victory, I'm going to tell you right now, just grab hold of God's plan for your life. And if you don't know it, grab hold of God and he's going to reveal to you his plan. There was a plan here. And the disciples were looking at Jesus on the cross and saying, come off of it. Come on, Jesus. Don't die. Don't die. Don't die. And he was going, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you know what he was saying? God, they don't know your plan. But God, I know your plan. So forgive them, God. Forgive them. Jesus died on that cross because it was God's plan for him to die. So the disciples run and flee. Oh, my gosh, Jesus has died. Guys, Jesus had told them he was going to die. But then he had also told them he was going to raise up from the dead again. He told them that. But I will arise in three days. They didn't hear that. Oh, you're not going to die, Jesus. You're not going to. He goes, you're right. I'm not going to die. I'm going to live for everlasting eternity. But I've got to die physically in order for that to happen. Right? Don't we have to die to self and be raised up into a new life, an eternal one? We're going to do that this morning, right? Guys, we got five people up front that are going to get baptized this morning. Praise God. They're going to come and they're going to give their life to the Lord, right? They're going to get wet. But this is a different kind of wet because no towel is going to dry it off, right? I'm just telling you, no towel is going to dry it off. So, guys, I just, I, 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 I just want to tell you, in closing, Job 19, Job 19. And, and multimedia team, forgive me. I'm just following the lead of the Spirit today. Thank you for just bearing with me in this. Guys, can we just give uh, praise to our, our media team? They do such an amazing job. Love you guys. And, and let me tell you guys, I could not. I could not be up here and do the things I do without their insight and their help and, and, and love. And, and, and I just appreciate them so much. Job 19, 20, uh, or, or, or Job 19, and I have down here 21 to 17. Hmm, that's interesting. It's 21 to 27. Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy, for the hand of God has struck me. Anyone ever felt like the hand of God struck you? Right? Right? You hear God saying he's going to uphold you in your right hand. And many of us have said, no, he didn't uphold me. He slapped me. <laughs> Let me tell you, if God had slapped you, you wouldn't be here. God is upholding you. All of us. He's upholding you in his right hand. He says, must you also persecute me like God does? 
Let me tell you something, church. Okay? I, I've heard my kids tell me this. I used to tell my dad this. I'm like, yeah, Dad, you beat me, and, and you don't love me. And, and let me tell you, my dad used to say, son, if I beat you like I wanted to beat you, you wouldn't be here. Come on, Brother Rick. You got it. You're hearing it, right? Lord, I'm just telling you right now, none of you have ever gotten a beating from God. Instead, what you've gotten is the heartbeat of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen in this place today? Amen. The heartbeat of God. Right? He says, haven't you chewed me up enough? Here's Job. He's saying, God, all these things that are happening, I know you're in control. And why are you doing this to me, God? Can I just say this? If you know who God is, then you know that God has a plan. And if he has a plan, you're not complaining, you're complying. Yeah, you heard me. You're not complaining, you're complying. My word says that godliness with contentment is great gain. It doesn't say godliness is great gain. It says godliness with contentment. What I'm saying, church, is we got to stop complaining and we got to start complying in Jesus' name. Okay. And it said here, oh, that my words could be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument. Thank God that when we say foolish things, he doesn't remember them. See, we want to inscribe and we want to make a point and God's like, nope, I'm going to rip that page out. We're just going to shred that right now because I'm not going to remember it. He says, carve it with an iron chisel, and I'm going to fill it with lead and grave forever in the rock. Thank you, God, that you didn't take my foolishness and put it into remembrance. You said that my foolishness, my sins, my transgressions, my iniquities are forgiven, and they are that you cast them as far as the east is from the west. And in case you don't know it, the east will never touch the west. Amen. Amen? But as for me... I know that my Redeemer lives. I know. I know. I know when I'm in pain, when I'm hurting, my Redeemer lives. I know, God, when I give in to temptation that my Redeemer still lives. I know, God, when I break your heart, my Redeemer still lives. I know, God, when my fear and doubts overtake me because I allow them to, rather than having faith in you, my Redeemer still lives. I know, God, that even when I make what I think is the most egregious mistake, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Come on. Come on. Praise the word of the Lord this morning. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. And that is what overwhelms me. Guys, God has a plan. And his plan will include miracles. I'm not down trotting miracles. They're a part of who God is. But we got to stop begging for miracles and we got to start asking God to show us his plan. Amen. When we start following God's plan, miracles are going to happen. And let me just say this to you right now. The miracles that happen may not be the miracles you expect to happen. Amen. Because I will say this to you. If God never did anything else, the fact that when you confessed that you were a sinner and you believed in your heart that Jesus' blood could save you, and then you confessed and believed that God had raised his son from the dead, Amen. the Bible says... You are saved. Hallelujah. God's plan turning out the miracle. So if God did nothing else for you, you are a miracle because of God's plan. So for a moment, church, would you just bow your head?
see, guys, everything that we spoke on today wasn't a, 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 a death sentence. In fact, what we talked about today took us the opposite direction. It spoke life. It spoke truth. And I just heard that word, freedom. Right? The freedom to know that I can trust God's plan. As long as I know God's plan. And let me tell you, God doesn't want to keep his plan secret from you. But if you're more interested in everything else, then he can't give you the plan. So today, church, I want you to take just a moment with God. And even if you think, well, pastor, I'm, I'm doing what God tells me. I'm following his plan. No, you know what? Just, just humble yourself for a moment. Because I had to humble myself when I read this. It spoke to my heart to where I got on my knees and said, God, forgive me that I've been demanding miracles instead of being obedient and just listening to your plan. Amen. See, God's plan comes with God's promises. And God's promises are filled with his miracles, right? Amen. So we should anticipate that. You should anticipate that, right? But it starts by believing in God's plan first. See, God's plan was to love the world by giving his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was God's plan, right? Amen. And Jesus fulfilled God's plan. He succeeded. Amen. And through his succession of obedience became the, became the release of miracles like we couldn't imagine. And they've been happening ever since. But I'm just wondering, church, if we're willing to just take a minute to say, Lord, forgive me. I haven't completely sought out your plan. Or maybe what you're going to say today is, Lord, forgive me because I haven't accepted your plan. Or, Lord, forgive me that I never wanted to know your plan. Guys, this confession comes with redemption. It comes with forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Amen? So you're not going to leave here defeated today. You're going to leave here triumphant. That's what Jesus did. He spit on tradition, said, we're going to get rid of tradition, and I'm going to show you how to live triumphant. Right? I want to know how to live like that. But the only way I'm going to be able to know is follow God's plan. So after your confession, would you take a moment to say, God, I surrender to your plan. It's that easy. It is that easy to say, God, I surrender to your plan. Does it mean it's going to be easy to follow the plan? No, we're human beings and we have our moments when we think, God, are you out of your mind? Here's what God says. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. <laughs> yes, I'm out of my mind. But I'm going to tell you right now, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for you to succeed. There is a young man in the hospital right now. And God's not finished with him yet. But the Bible says where two or three will come together agreeing, agreeing meaning, meaning that we are going to believe together, right? Amen. He says it will be so. So we're going to practice this this morning for just a moment. I want us all to clear our minds. I want us all to see Brother Gabe there right now in his hospital bed because he's going to feel right now what's about to come out of this church because we're going to stand in agreement together. Lord, you're not finished with him yet. We, and we know that because we see what you are doing in him. So we know, Lord, you're not calling him home. And we believe that. Do you believe that? We believe that, Lord. And so you said that if we stand in agreement believing, it will be so. So all I'm saying, church, is prepare to see Brother Gabriel again. Prepare to see him again. Now, let me just say this to you right now. Sometimes we finish our work and God takes us home. But God never takes that one home without us realizing 
that they completed their assignment. Oh, we shed tears. We miss our loved ones when they go, you know, and sometimes it seems unexpected. But can I say this right now? The one thing that I want to believe is that when Jesus calls one of his children home, it's because he can't wait to tell them, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Right? And so I have peace to know that those who have gone before us have heard the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I can have peace. Doesn't mean I'm not going to shed some tears. I'm going to shed tears. I'm going to miss them. But what I'm saying to you is let's let God show us his plan so we will know how to rejoice when he calls them home or when he raises them up out of their bed. Guys, I'm just saying sometimes it can get confusing because we're going, God, you raised one up. Why didn't you raise the other up? And God is going, if you knew my plan, you would understand that believers always get raised up. Amen. I call it a win-win situation. Whether he raises you back up into this world or raises you back up into his kingdom, it's called resurrection, period, for the believer. Can I give a amen and glory to God in this place this morning? Win, win for the believer. Here's the question, though. Do you really believe? Because the only way you're going to get God's plan is if you truly believe. Amen? Church, I'm just telling you right now, as for me and my house, honey, we're standing together in this. I'll stand with you on this. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's going to be hard sometimes. Because you know me. I still need work. But believe in the God who is working in me. And no, baby, he is going to perfect me one day. Because he's perfecting me right now. For the day of my perfection. And I love what I see in you. I love what God is doing in you. You are an amazing mother. You are an amazing grandmother. You're an amazing wife. You're an amazing friend. You're an amazing employee. You are beautiful beyond imagination. And I just want to speak that over you right now. Why am I doing this? Because I want to set an example for what you better do today when you leave here today. Speak over somebody. Set aside your condensation, condensation and your, and your, and your, uh, your condensation, uh, whatever that word is. I'm not even going to speak it, <laughs> right? Come on. Pastor trying to speak big words. I need to take it easy. Guys, I know we've gone for a while here, but I'm not going to not let God be God for you. Because he loves you so much. So I, I want to close with a quick story, and then we're going to. Do some worship and baptisms to close the day. If you need to go, um, we understand that. Don't worry about it. If you, when the time comes, if you need to depart, that's fine. But this means so much to me, guys. Because back at Billy Babe, was it 2005 or 2004? I couldn't remember. Thank you. That's why she's here. I, I was going the wrong way. 2006, my wife... Went, we went to Texas with the kids to the Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. My wife needed a procedure. It was going to be an in and out. It's supposed to be a one day where she went in in the morning, had surgery. We was going to be released that afternoon. We went up a couple days early to take the kids to Six Flags and SeaWorld and spend some time together. So that Wednesday and Thursday, we had a great time as a, as a family. Friday morning, my wife goes into the, uh, into the surgery room to have the surgery. She has her surgery for about three hours. Take her to recovery. They tell us we can come to recovery. We walk into the recovery room. And as soon as I walk in, I look at my wife. She is sitting up, and I've never seen her so afraid, ever. I've never seen my wife this afraid. And she just was staring at me. She couldn't blink her eyes. She couldn't move her arms, and she couldn't speak. And I could just, as her husband, I could feel her saying, help me, help me, help me, something's wrong. And so uh, my mother-in-law was there, and, 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 and so uh, she went and got a nurse, and they went and got the doctor. And he comes in and goes, what's going on? I said, I think my wife's had a stroke. And the doctor said, what do you know? You're not a doctor. I'm sure she's fine. And he went and grabbed her hands. He did the light to her eyes. He touched her face, and he immediately said, 
you guys need to go into the waiting room. They began to bring in nurses and teams, and for the next few hours, they were working on my wife. And a few hours later, they walk in, and, and they're like, um, Mr. Balderrama, your wife's had a stroke. We don't know how it happened, but a blood clot has burst in her brain. And we don't think she's going to make it. I had children. We have four wonderful children. And they were back at the hotel waiting to just for us to walk back with, with, with Mama. And, and now here's my wife. And, and I don't even know if I'm going to come out with her. Guys, I wasn't serving the Lord. I'm just going to be honest with you. I wasn't serving the Lord. I hadn't given my life to Christ. I was bitter. I was angry at God. And so this was making me just more bitter and angry. But I heard my mother, and she's like, George, we should pray. And I said, well, Mom, you're going to have to pray because I can't. And so she did. She prayed for my wife. So the doctor came back. He said, we, 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 it's the weekend. We don't have the staff we need, but we've just asked a couple guys to come in. Your wife, we need to check her heart, see what's happened, what's going on. Guys, my wife is, is dying. There seemed to be no hope. And I was finally going, God, give me a miracle. Can I just tell you right now, God didn't want to give me a miracle. What he wanted me to do was find out what his plan was. I thought I needed a miracle. God says, what you need is my plan. I didn't, couldn't believe this would be God's plan. And here it was. They went in. They said, we're going to take your wife in. We're going to do this procedure. We're going to put a scope in her. We're going to uh, take a picture of her heart, go through it, see what's going on. And they said, it will take about an hour. And they're like, it's an evasive procedure. It's not going to be bad. It's not, it, it, it's, it's, it, you know, you'll be able to come back and see her. So does this go tell your kids that, that uh, you know, mom is doing okay. And, and uh, when you come back, we'll know more. I was gone for an hour, guys. And when I came back, walking down the hallway, this is now Saturday morning. I'm walking down the hallway. My mother-in-law comes running down. She goes, where have you been? We've been trying to call, ta- call the hotel room. Nobody's answering the phone. I said, well, we told the kids not to answer the phone or answer the door. She says, you need to come now. Laura is dying, suffocating to death. I'm like, what? And I run to the room, and they won't let me in. They just will let me look through the window. And I'm looking at the window, and my wife is completely blue. I thought she was dead. I'd never seen a body like that. She was completely blue. And a nurse came out and said, Mr. Balderrama, we need to talk to you. And I said, yeah, somebody needs to talk to me. And they said, Mr. Balderrama, uh, your wife was allergic to the numbing agent. We didn't know it. So now the oxygen will not attach to her blood cells. She is suffocating from the inside out, and we're losing her. One time, all right, God, but two times? What do you want from me, God? You know that I hate you right now. And now you're doing this. You're taking the one good thing in my life, God. And you're going to take it away. You're going to break the hearts of our babies, God. And yet, you want me to pray? You want me to ask you for help? A few minutes later, a gentleman walked out, another nurse, and he took my hands. He said, Mr. Valderrama, you sit down. I said, I can't sit right now. I said, I feel like I need to punch a wall. He says, well, let me just talk to you. He says, I have some good news for you. I said, what's that? He says, first of all, he says, we've discovered that your wife has a hole in her heart, and that's how the blood clot got through to her brain. So we know what's going on. We can fix that. And I said, well, how can you fix that if she's dying? He goes, she's not dying anymore. He says she has a rare condition. It's only happened five times in, 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 in the military. It's happened five times in like 50 years. There's been cases like this. He says it just so happens. He says I was in New York last year when this happened to another patient. And I knew I got to see the antidote that would save her life. So I knew what to give her. Come on, come on. I know that my Redeemer lives even when he isn't my Redeemer yet. He lives. This man is like, 
I knew what to give her, and I gave it to her right away. She's in full recovery. Then I got a phone call and, and, and in the hotel room. They said, hey, we just want to let you know there's only one doctor who can fix your wife's hole in her heart. He's in Seattle fishing. We just got a hold of him. He has gotten on a plane. He'll be here Sunday morning, and he's going to fix your wife's heart. Sunday morning, he walked in. He still had a fishing jacket on, fishing hat with all the lures and stuff on it. He's like, who's the husband? Who's the husband? I'm like, I'm right here. He looked at me, and he said, I just want to tell you, I'm the best of the best of the best. He says, your wife will walk out of this hospital. Three hours later, he comes out to tell me they had closed the hole in my wife's heart. Then they told me that there was no blood on her brain. It had disappeared. She had her full color back. Two days later, we're with the doctor. They're getting ready to release her. And they asked my wife, they said, do you have any questions as they went over? Because she had to be on blood thinners and everything. And, 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 and oh, you know what? I'm kind of getting ahead of here, aren't I, babe? Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm excited because all this is happening, right? But here's the thing. She, she cannot feed herself. She cannot speak anymore. She doesn't know how to use her hands. So for the next six months, I was working with a therapist. And thank God the Air Force let me go for six months to be with my wife. I want to thank God for the military. Because they let me be home with my wife while she recovered. And in six months, Laura learned how to walk again, feed herself, and speak again. If you look at that woman, you have no idea she had a stroke, do you? But can I just say it was after that when she had recovered completely, we went back to the medical center and that I jumped the story. So let me get to this real quick. I'm sorry for keeping you. But you, I wanted to share. God laid my heart to share this with you. We go back right six months later. Now she's walking and talking, feeding herself. She's in full health. And, 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 and the doctor goes over her what she needs to be careful of because she's on blood thinners and so forth. And then he says to her, he says, honey, do you have any questions for me? You know what my wife, Laura, asked him? She said, am I going to be able to get more tattoos? <laughs> That's what she asked. Am I going to be able to get more tattoos? And the doctor was like, well, I've never been asked that question before, sweetie. He's like, I wouldn't suggest it while you're on the blood thinners. But once you come off that, you need to get a tattoo. You go get a tattoo. That's when I knew that my wife was alive and well. Five years later, I would give my life to the Redeemer that I know lives. Our lives would be changed and, and God would transform us and now here we are standing here in front of you on Resurrection Sunday to tell you that Laura and I know that our Redeemer lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. But the same Jesus that lives in me is the same Jesus who wants to live in all of us. The same Jesus that wants to reach this community for Christ. Church, are we ready? Are we ready to declare in this house and declare on these streets and declare in our homes and declare wherever we are that I know that my Redeemer lives? Would you stand as the worship team comes? We're going to worship the Lord for a few moments and then we're going we're to baptize a few people today. Amen? Come on, stand up and praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. So I was praying about the scripture, and I, I love how the Holy Spirit does this. And uh, this morning as I was getting ready, he told me Psalm 47. I know we memorized scripture, but I don't remember what that was about. It says, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible, and he is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. 
He shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises for our God is the king of all the earth. Sing you praises with understanding. God reigns over the heathen and God sits upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to our God and he is greatly exalted. Let's shout and sing and praise the one who reigns. (laughs) 